Hey everyone, welcome back to the online ministry of Grace Baptist Church. If you're new to our ministry, we're glad you're here. Today we're beginning a new series in the life of Solomon called Cracks in the Foundation. The story of his leadership as king is told as an explanation for why Israel was eventually divided as a nation and carried off into exile. There were cracks in the foundation of his life and leadership, and those affected his people for generations to come. Today's passage looks at some of the problems present, even in his rise to the throne, because of his father's reluctance to secure his legacy. I wonder how much you think about your own legacy. Mickey Mantle is a man who will inevitably be remembered for his complicated legacy. He's remembered as one of the greatest baseball players of all time. But anyone who knows about his life outside of baseball knows that it was as tragic as his career was spectacular. In the last press conference he gave, he said, I'd like to say to the kids out there, if you're looking for a role model, this is a role model. Don't be like me. His biographer called him a weepy, abusive drunk who immiserated his wife, turned his sons into underage drinking buddies, and treated his adoring young fans like a swarm of annoying flies. At his funeral, he asked country singer Roy Clark to sing the tragic ballad, Yesterday When I Was Young. It ends with these words. There are so many songs in me that won't be sung. I feel the bitter taste of tears upon my tongue. The time has come for me to pay for yesterday when I was young. Is that the kind of song you'll have sung at your funeral? Is that how you'll be remembered? Is that the kind of legacy you'll leave behind? I want to urge you to consider the kind of legacy that you'll leave and the mark that you're making on those who come after you. To do that, I'd ask you to turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 1. I'll begin reading verses 1 to 4. If you don't have a Bible, just click on the link for today's passage in the YouTube description below. I'll start reading at 1 Kings 1 verse 1. Now King David was old and advanced in years, and although they covered him with clothes, he could not get warm. Therefore his servant said to him, Let a young woman be sought for my lord the king, and let her wait on the king and be in his service. Let her lie in your arms, that my lord the king may be warm. So they sought for a beautiful young woman throughout all the territory of Israel, and found Abishag the Shunammite, and brought her to the king. The young woman was very beautiful, and she was of service to the king and attended to him, but the king knew her not. This is the word of God. Now, every detail of this description is important to take in. We're told that David is old. He's about 70 years old at this point, but in 1000 BC, this was much older than the average person was expected to live. Age and life as a fugitive warrior had taken their toll on him, and so he wasn't able to keep warm. They'd wrap him up in thick sweaters and snuggle blankets, but he was still constantly shivering. So the king's staff staged a Miss Israel contest to find the most beautiful woman in the land. Instead of a crown, they assigned the winner the role of royal water bottle. She's supposed to snuggle up to the king and keep him warm. In verse 4, when it says, the woman was very beautiful, but the king knew her not, the message is that David is just a shell of the man who spotted Bathsheba on the rooftop and called her to his palace. He's in his last days. Now, there's nothing tragic about a great man growing old, but we're supposed to read this description with a sense of panic. Israel's king is no longer fit to lead, but he hasn't done anything to set the stage for his successor. He won't act to secure his legacy. Maybe he doesn't want to let go of his privileges as king. Maybe he doesn't want to admit his age and the reality of his health. Maybe he's afraid that people will treat him differently. Whatever it is, his refusal to act his age and prepare for the next generation puts the entire kingdom in jeopardy. His legacy is about to be ruined because he's put off the inevitable. 
He's living as if he'll never die. And so he never puts his affairs in order. And I think we all deal with this at some level. We put off anything that we don't enjoy dealing with. We put off difficult conversations. We put off things that we're not good at. We put off things that make us confront hard realities. Why is it that people avoid making wills or planning for retirement or their own funeral? Mickey Mantle put off the ine inevitable when he treated his sons as drinking partners and didn't think it would lead to their own addiction. He put off the inevitable when he mistreated his wife and didn't think that it would lead to misery and breakdown in their marriage. Churches put off the inevitable when they refused to face the reality of their own decline. Pastors put off the inevitable when they fail to prepare for what comes after them. A legacy can be ruined when we put off the inevitable. Are there things that God has laid on your heart that you're putting off or refusing to deal with? Psalm 119, verse 16, it says, I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. You own your own legacy when you treat God's word with a sense of urgency. He says, I do not delay. You're not putting God off and telling him to come back when it's more convenient. Or uh, Psalm 90 verse 12 says, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. You own your own legacy when you're conscious of time. And this is opposite of the world's wisdom that says to live for the moment. You need to look at your watch and get out a calendar from time to time. While David was thinking about how to keep warm with the beauty queen in bed next to him, his kingdom was about to fall and his legacy was about to be ruined. Finally, Psalm 39 verse 4 says, O Lord, make me know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. You own your own legacy when you realize how short life is and you prepare for what comes next. Are you prepared to meet God? Are you prepared to face judgment? When you see how short life is, it helps you to keep an eye on eternity and be wiser in the moment. Own your own legacy. Now the frail picture of David in his late days refusing to announce his successor makes us fear for the kingdom. His legacy is in jeopardy. And so we're not too surprised when we see what happens in verse 5. It says, Now Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. Adonijah is an opportunist. He sees that David is weak and decides to make his move. He's the fourth son of King David, but by this point, Amnon the firstborn and Absalom the third have both been killed. We don't know, but we assume that Kiliab, Kiliab the secondborn son of David, has already died as well. Now, Adonijah knew Moses had taught that God would choose the king, and both Saul and David had been appointed by a prophet. He also knew that God had told David that Solomon would succeed him as ruler. But when he saw that his father wasn't going to act to secure his legacy, he was determined to steal his own. The text says that Adonijah exalted himself. He decided to give himself a promotion. Rather than being appointed king, he announced that he'd be king. He prepares chariots and horsemen and men to run ahead of him as a way of acting like a king before he actually is a king. In verse 6, we're told that he's very handsome and born next after Absalom. And in fact, everything about how he acts reminds us of his older brother. And that's a problem because Absalom staged a coup and ran David out of town in a rebellion. And it looks like history is repeating itself. And this time, the rebellion could, could succeed. Now, he rounds out some of David's inner circle including his former general Joab and a priest named Abiathar. And they put together a secret coronation banquet with the other royal sons and many of the palace officials. Only 
Solomon wasn't on the guest list. Nor was the prophet Nathan or Benaiah the head of David's royal guard. It looks like we're about to witness the end of David's legacy. We're about to see the reign of a man after God's own heart ended by a proud son who doesn't care about God's heart or his commandments. And just as we're wondering how this could happen, verse 6 gives us the answer. It says, His father had never at any time displeased him by asking, Why have you done thus and so? Now, David was a man after God's own heart. He loved the Lord and enjoyed a vital relationship with him. But he was an ineffective father. He was ineffective because he was unwilling to discipline his own children. The text says he, he never wanted to displease Adonijah. But this is a pattern we see with his other children as well. He didn't engage in the hard work of discipline. He wouldn't say no and mean it. He didn't follow through with consequences. A legacy can be ruined when we refuse to do the hard things. As a parent, you regularly see the seeds of sin in your child's life. It happens at a very young age. And you tell yourself, it's not that serious. It's not that big of a deal. But the problem is that the seeds grow. And eventually, it's almost impossible to root them out. Establishing patterns of obedience, self-control, and respect has to start early with loving but firm and consistent discipline. A parent has to be willing to do the hard things. Proverbs 29, 15 says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Notice the two things it mentioned. There's rod and reproof, consequences and communication. We need to teach our children the right thing to do as well as the reason to do it. But then we need to be willing to do more than just talk. We need to be willing to give them consequences when they refuse. Anything less is to leave a child to deal with sin on their own, and the verse warns that the result is shame. Proverbs 22.15 says something similar. It says, Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. It's saying that children are born cute, but not wise. They need to be shown the right way, but they also need consequences that will convince them of the right way. And too often our parenting consists of empty threats and half-hearted responses to sin. And that sends a message that we just don't see it as that big of a deal. David's sons show us what happens when we do that. In fact, I'm convinced that part of the thesis of 1 Kings in this chapter is that David's unwillingness to discipline his children was one of the factors that led to the nation's divide and eventual exile to Assyria and Babylon. The stakes in parenting are far higher than we typically admit. Own your legacy because it can be ruined when we refuse to do the hard things. Now, as we return to the chapter, it looks as, as if all is lost. David is nearing death, but he can't be bothered to face it or prepare the nation for what comes next. And the son he refused to discipline has crowned himself king and celebrating his coronation. All would be lost if God didn't act through his prophet Nathan. And so there's hope and relief when we see him appear in verse 11. Follow along as I read from verses 11 to 14. Then Nathan said to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, Have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king, and David our Lord does not know it? Now therefore come, let me give you advice that you may save your own life and the life of your son Solomon. Go in at once to King David and say to him, Did you not, my lord, the king, swear to your servant, saying, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne? Why then is Adonijah king? Then, while you are still speaking with the king, I also will come in after you and confirm your words. Anyone 
Some find it strange that the prophet goes to the queen Bathsheba instead of King David. It seems he's concerned that David won't listen if he goes to him directly. So he enlists Bathsheba's help and warns her that not only her life, but Solomon's life is on the line if she doesn't act immediately and persuasively. But he's not content to even leave things with the queen. He stages this elaborate scene where she rushes in first, and just as she finishes speaking, he rushes in as well and repeats a similar message. Everything's calculated for maximum effect. And the impression that we're left with is that it'll take all the drama, plots, and persuasion that Nathan and Bathsheba can muster to move David to act. And you have to ask yourself, am I that guy? Do people have to go to great lengths to get through to you? Do they have to strategize to get you to confront the truth and deal with reality? Let's be people who own our legacy, who aren't so stubborn that people have to tiptoe around us and coordinate their efforts to get us to listen. Thankfully, God gave David a prophet like Nathan. His plan worked, and David acted to do what he had been putting off for too long. In verse 30, he vows to uh, announce Solomon as king that very day. He has Solomon ride on his own mule, and Zadok the priest anoint him. When they blew the trumpet, shouts of, Long live King Solomon! went up. And then in verse 40, it says, All the people went up after him, playing on pipes and rejoicing with great joy, so that the earth was split by their noise. The message is that a legacy can be redeemed. It can be redeemed when we respond to God's initiative. On his own, David would never have acted. Without God's intervention, the kingdom would have been stolen by a proud and selfish man who was outside of God's purposes and promises and plan. David's legacy would have been ruined. But as he responded to God, it was redeemed. When the guests at Adonijah's secret coronation banquet hear the people rejoicing in Solomon's announcement as king, they know they're in trouble. And so everybody runs for cover. Adonijah flees to the altar seeking mercy even though he knows that he's guilty of treason. Solomon spares his life, giving him another chance as long as he shows himself worthy. And with that, peace is restored to the kingdom. The promised righteous king is on the throne, and God has orchestrated all of it. Where does the message of this chapter hit you? Are you curled up trying to keep warm like David was, but ignoring the decisions and the issues in your life that really need to be addressed? Are you good at living for today, but not so much about planning for tomorrow? Are there decisions or areas of trust and obedience that you know that God has called you to, but you just keep putting off? Own your legacy. Don't put off the inevitable. Do you relate to David's tendency to want to keep his children happy rather than confront the sin in their lives before it grows? Do you send your kids the message that sin ultimately doesn't matter or that they're the ones who are really in control? Are you teaching them that God's warnings are just empty threats by never following through on your own words? Own your legacy. Lean into the hard things that God has called you to do. Now, I think there's a bit of David in all of us. We can all relate to ways that we're slow to act and more passive than we'd like. And sometimes the pattern's so deep in our lives that we can feel hopeless and condemned. We've been like this so long and the mistakes are so many that there's not much hope that things will ever be different. If you're feeling like that, Know that your legacy can be redeemed. This chapter shows that it can. When we respond to God's initiative, he changes the math and redefines what's possible. In David's case, that meant ending an insurrection without a sword being drawn. The rebellion was defeated and the righteous king of peace was installed. 
It wasn't as if all the consequences of David's past actions and inactions were erased, but God had begun to redeem his legacy. And he'll do the same in our lives today. But he does that as we respond to his initiative. He calls us to answer his invitation. Psalm 95, 7 and 8 says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Don't put off the inevitable. Don't think you're okay because you've just heard a sermon and you felt something. Not hardening your heart means not being stubborn. It means we make changes. We can't undo our past, but we can respond to the God who can redeem our legacy. We can make the most of today and we can follow where God leads us tomorrow. Second Corinthians 6 2 says, Behold, now is a favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And the message is, don't think that there's another time to respond to God or a better time to respond to him. Don't put him off in your life. Now is the day of salvation. Now is when we invite him to rewrite our next chapter. Now is when we respond to his initiative to redeem our legacy. Sometimes, though, it feels like we're too late. In Mickey Mantle's case, how do you redeem a legacy after decades spent destroying it? At one point, his doctor said that he had damaged his liver so badly after 40 years of drinking that it looked like a doorstop. He told him his next drink could be his last. Finally, at age 63, he checked himself into rehab. He realized he had been telling the same old stories about getting drunk, and he realized that they just weren't funny anymore. The reality is they never had been. He admitted the ways that he'd hurt his family and friends, and he sought to make amends. His former teammate, Bobby Richardson, shared the gospel with him, and Mantle professed faith in Jesus. The day before he died, Richardson visited him to encourage him and make sure that he'd really understood the gospel. After he shared, his wife told how she trusted in Jesus. And then she asked him a question. She said, Mickey, if God were here today and you were standing before him and he would ask the question, why should I let you in my heaven? What would you say? And he replied, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son and whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. At his funeral, Richardson shared that story along with a poem that Mantle requested. In it, there's a line that goes like this. This crowd on earth, they soon forget the heroes of the past. They cheer like mad until you fail, and that's how long you last. But in God's hall of fame, by just believing on his son, inscribed you'll find your name. I tell you, friend, I wouldn't trade my name, however small, that's written there beyond the stars in that celestial hall for any famous name on earth or glory that it shares. I'd rather be an unknown here and have my name up there. Do you know that your name's written up there in the book of life? Do you know that because you've put your full weight of trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? If not, don't put off the inevitable. Today is the day of salvation. Turn to Jesus in faith and let God redeem your legacy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we recognize that we want to put, put off so many things that are uncomfortable to consider. We don't want to think about the hard things. We don't want to deal with the hard things. It's one of the reasons we put off thinking about death, thinking about the end. It's one of the reasons that we avoid disciplining our children. And yet we know that in doing so, we so often 
lead our, ourselves and those who follow us into regret. Thank you that you are the God who redeems our legacy. Thank you that you are the God who can write the last chapter of our lives and do so in a way that gives us hope, gives us relief, gives us joy. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the great invitation that you give us in Christ, the hope that there is in him. And I pray that if there is anyone listening now who does not know that their name is written in the book of life, draw them, help them to come, because surely now is the time, today is the day of salvation. Lead them to yourself, Father, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I hope this message has helped you to see how you can take ownership of your legacy by not putting off the inevitable or avoiding the hard things. I pray it gives you hope that God can redeem your legacy. And that happens when you respond to his in initiative. If it stirred up questions for you, if you're interested in learning more about how to respond to Jesus, then send me an email or leave a comment below. If you think this is a message that others need to hear, share the link and help spread the word. As always, for more messages of hope, visit gracebc.ca. God bless and see you next time.